And so, uh, as we move into our sort of next transition, I would just like to remind everybody that uh, we are all here in a very good way and uh, to discuss this issue that we've been hearing about, that many people are concerned about. And uh, so, uh, we're discussing this issue in a good way, in a respectful way, in a respectful manner. And we'd like to invite all of you, our friends, neighbours, community members, family, to come on up to the two microphones, remembering that uh, please speak right into the microphone. And uh, two minute limit, otherwise this person will be on top of you. So, so uh, with that, we'll take uh, two minutes from Mayor Streeper. Okay, thanks very much. First of all, I'd like to make some comments. You, know, you said that 15% uh, of water was allowed, and you like the figure less than five. I would say to you, sir, that uh, right now, water withdrawal is less than 1%. So uh, that's well below the figure you even said that was acceptable. Chad, I'd like to mention something here that in the last year we got an average of 74.5 millimeters of rain for July, August, and September. The average for this uh, is 225 millimeters. So we received uh, approximately one third of our normal water flow. I'd like to ask uh, Chief Wilderman concerning some comments that were made in uh, Vancouver, uh, November of this year on uh, your behalf by a reporter where it was stated that an oil company, and I'm quoting from the writing here, would enable the company to dam, and I'm using the word dam, and divert three million of liters of fresh water a year from the Nelson River. I've checked with five government agencies as of today, there is no applications by any oil company to dam the river. This goes on to say that this oil company's application would involve constructing a 20 meter concrete barrier across the river is just one of the 20 applications throughout the province. My question is when you're looking for support and when you're looking for the use of water here, why do you not present facts to uh, public meetings? And where did the word dam come up? Because there is no dam, there will be no dam, there is no application for a dam, but yet these are the words that you have passed on to the public. Thank you. So we'll let uh, Chief Wildman respond to that. Thanks, uh, Mayor Streeper. I really appreciate you coming up and asking the first question and getting it going. Um, in the article, nowhere did I ever mention dam. The statement I read today is exactly my position. And I did um, stress that it was a 20 meter concrete block in the Fort Nelson River to divert and contaminate 3 billion liters of water every year. Um, also, I'd like to clarify that uh, the Fort Nelson First Nation isn't at anti-fracking as the media has portrayed us to be. Um, we are very involved in the oil and gas industry through some of our companies. We do look forward to the economic benefits to our community members, as well as to BC residents and anyone who would like to come in our traditional territory and work. Um, as I said again, I cannot be uh, responsible for what the media or reporters present. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Streeper, for your question. Thanks, Chief Willowin. And there was uh, just one second. Oh, and okay, pause. <laughs> um, I think that Mayor Streeper, did you have a question for Jill, or was it a com was that as a comment? Okay. comment on that comment is we don't know what this impact of 1% is. 1% okay, maybe not. Maybe some rivers suffer at 1%, maybe 0.5%, and maybe in some location, 0% is what is required. We don't know. We need to do our homework. We haven't done our homework. Okay, I'm sorry, I really said that, Pat. So, uh, Pat Pim, please uh, ask a question or comment. 
Yeah, good evening, and uh, thanks a lot for, for putting this on. And, 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 and water is a big issue. I'm, I'm the MLA for the area, so I felt it uh, was important that I come up and, and be part of this discussion tonight. But I want to throw out a few more facts, uh, because I, I know it's a big issue, uh, and, and, and I think it's uh, both sides of the story has to be told to some degree. Uh, so I'm going to put a couple of, of, of things on the, on the record here tonight. When we talk about water licenses, as of 20, uh, December 2011, there's 362 water licenses that allow for an annual withdrawal of 196 billion cubic meters of water in the Peace Country and the Northern Rockies combined. Uh, and that license, those licenses do not include the storage power licenses for BC Hydro and the Williston Reservoir, because that's a substantially higher license. Uh, the short-term water approvals that are issued by the Oil and Gas Commission for the entire Peace River and Northern Rockies regions totaled uh, 28 million cubic meters, and the amount that's actually used is about 3.8 cubic meters, 3.8 million cubic meters, sorry, that's actually used on the annual basis at this point in time. To put that in perspective, the community of Fort St. John, where I live, uses on average about 4 million cubic meters of water annually. So I, I really, it, we have to get this discussion into a perspective that, that the rest of us can understand. I mean, I don't know what cubic meters mean when you start talking and, and billions of cubic liters. Uh, it, it, it sounds like big numbers, and it is big numbers. One other uh, point that I'd like to point out is that there are currently 34 water license applications in the queue in northeastern BC. And these are for a variety of purposes, including one for power, one for conservation, five for irrigation, one for water delivery, two for stock watering, one for domestic, three for mining purposes, uh, coal, one for processing, and 19 for oil injection. Flannery is currently looking at the 14 uh, of the non-oil and gas related licenses and one uh, in the, uh, for the oil and gas industry. There's been a total of, I believe, five licenses issued. Uh, should get to that note here over the past uh, little bit. Uh, two of those have been licenses that are withdrawal for water in the Peace Country uh, out of the Williston Reservoir. Uh, they're for 10,000 10, cubic meters per day, uh, and that that allows for enough. Uh, we, we heard people talk about the burrow pits. Uh, it does allow to, to pull water out of the reservoir, fill the burrow pits, so that they have access to that water during the entire year when the fracking operations will take place. And all that, just to put that, that sounds like a lot of lot of, lot of water coming out of the Williston Reservoir. To put that in perspective, the 10,000 cubic meters per day equates to five seconds of flow through the Peace Canyon Dam. So while it is a lot of water, we have a lot of water in this region. At present, you have 10 seconds. At present, we're using about 0.1 percent of all the water in the Peace and Northern Rockies region. Thank you. I may come from that. And this is a big issue that we have in Canada. It's the concept or the perception that there is so much water, there will always be plenty of water, and water is wasted. I live on Vancouver Island, it rains a lot, and we lack water at some locations. People have a lot of difficulty understanding how that I have to control my water consumption. Guys, it rains so much here. Let me use as much water as, as I can. So the problem is, when is the water available and when do we need the water? It rains a lot in the winter. We need water in the summer. So this is one 
critical element. The water is not always there when we need it. The second concept, which is very important, is that by nature, water is fully allocated. Before there were men on Earth, water was coming, water was going. There was no extra water. The Earth didn't have to ship water to Mars because there was too much water. This water had a role. There were ecosystems that developed, that grew, that were created because the water was available. So if we start modifying that, there will be a footprint. I understand we are people, we have societies, we have developed economical systems, we need the water, we'll have a footprint, I agree. But we have to discuss about that footprint, we have to assess the size of that footprint, and we have to know the size of the footprint before we make decisions. That's my comment. Thank you. Pat for bringing that forward. Maybe uh, Ben Parfit, do you have, I can't really see you, and I'm told I might get zapped if I go forward more. But uh, Ben Parfit, do you have any comments also? Uh, yes, I, have. I appreciate the points uh, uh, that Mr. Pam has made, uh, and uh, I would just like to respond by saying that um, two years ago, uh, on two, uh, two years ago and again last year, we had situations in which uh, very significant uh, prolonged uh, periods of drought occurred uh, in the southeast region, significant enough uh, in severity that um, the Oil and Gas Commission was actually uh, uh, compelled to order a halt to water takings by um, uh, uh, oil and gas. So, it tends to pick up on what uh, Gilles was just saying a moment ago, which is that, you know, things are always in a state of flux, and it, it's, uh, it's a constantly uh, a, a shifting picture in terms of water availability. That's the first thing we have to bear in mind. The second thing is that we have to understand that the plans as put forward by uh, the shale gas industry, without question, if they are followed through on, will result in very significant increases in water takings. And the big question, I think, from a planning perspective is, is what are we going to do now to ensure that we put in place the proper planning tools to uh, deal with what could be uh, significant increases in water takings in future years? And lastly, I think we have to make sure that we distinguish between different kinds of water licenses and different kinds of water use. Water use in a municipality that is then uh, subsequently treated and released back into the environment is a very different kettle of fish from taking water, pumping it deep underground to fracture rock, and having on your hands after that is done highly contaminated water that cannot be reintroduced to the hydrological system. So there's differences between different kinds of water use that we have to be uh, aware of and appreciate in terms of thinking through how we're going to plan uh, for the use of water resources in future years. Thank you, Ben. Um, we definitely welcome any other more questions and say people can ask questions or Bernadette. I would like Bernadette, to I'm sorry, you have to go to the microphone because, so that they can hear too. Sorry. I hear a lot of studies about all the water that's being used. I'd like to know what is the monitoring, the water quality out there. Because I know with aquifers, once you contaminate an aquifer, it's contaminated for a long time. So we're drinking that water, our animals that we're living off is being contaminated. So I never hear once what is the water quality, what's the baseline study for it. They, they're fracking all over in the territory, so how come that's not being focused on as well? So, um, so there's a couple of questions there. One of them is about monitoring, and um, who would like to answer that <laughs> or speak to that? Lana Lowe? Sure. Um, thanks, Bernadette. Um, 
we have been questioning the government on the the impacts of fracking fluids in the aquifers and in the uh, on, on the land. Um, at this point, there are no comprehensive monitoring programs in place to to assess either water quality or water water quantity and and from frack or the effects from fracking on those those elements in our territory. And I'm interested in, in hearing where. The, inform the those are great statistics. The point is one percent of the flow um, is being used in fracking. But from my work as lands director of the Fort Nelson First Nation, I don't know where the source of data is for that kind of um, that kind of information because we know that there is no monitoring programs in place. There are no baseline studies. All these things that we're calling for, we're hoping to arrive at, at information like what um, Mr. Pym has just presented. We want confidence in numbers like that. We want to. We want to know that. Yeah, it's only one percent. It's all good. But at this point, we don't have faith in the numbers that are being thrown around, the studies that are being put out there, because there are no real baseline studies. There's no monitoring. There's no metering. The work hasn't been done yet to to reach the conclusions that are being reached when these licenses are being issued. Thanks, Bernadette, for bringing that forward. Yeah. I'd also like to uh, talk about an article I read in the Taiyi, and it um, said that uh, one producer well site in northern BC, the company consumed more resources than a small city. It injected four, 417 million gallons of water along with 80,000 tons of sand as well as 8 million gallons of fracking chemicals. I know that we are saying that uh, it's 1% now. We would like to get more information on that. However, this is just the start. In four years, we're looking at a huge boom. We're looking at the Liard River Basin being opened up, and that will allow for other companies to use their full capacity. We know that water is going to be a huge demand in the next four years, and we feel that this is the time to start working together to find solutions for us to solve this problem and put these studies and all these five points that I've listed out there. We need to work together, we need to hear everyone's perspective, and we need to come up with solutions. Thank you, Chief Willeman. Uh, any more questions or comments from the floor, please feel free to grab a microphone. Uh, Pat is going to come on down again. And just make sure you speak really close to the microphone there. Yeah. Okay, I, I just I, I, I do want to respond to a couple more of these the, these things because I do have some information. I do have some pretty good stats that that are available through the Oil and Gas Commission. Number one, they're available through Flenrow Ministry. I'm the parliamentary secretary to uh, the Ministry of Flenrow to the to the northeast at this point in time. So if you want to stop me at two minutes, you're more than welcome to do that. I'll come back up here as many times as you want. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Parfit said there's no there's no plan. Um, uh, timing of withdrawals is a is a major issue, and I agree with that. Timing of withdrawals is a major issue. I think that uh, when you get into long-term licenses, it gives you the opportunity to plan, uh, so you can do your fracking in a in a uh, timelines that don't mean that you have to take withdrawals all the time, all year long. Go, going back to the burrow pits uh, that are used for storage, if you can withdraw put the water into, into the storage, into the burrow pits. Gives you the opportunity to, to withdraw during the high season, the high flows of, of your rivers, and, and then uh, don't take any withdrawals during the, uh, the low flow times in the summer months when it's uh, not raining, or the 40 year drought that we had last year. Uh, obviously you don't want to be doing with withdrawals that time of year, and the OGC put those uh, suspensions in place rightfully last year. Uh, so, to the to the point on on whether there's a plan, uh, the Ministry of uh, Flunro, previously MOE, has has uh, responsibility for water licensing. Their staff is experienced and professional. The license uh, review and decision making process is detailed. The process that they review with uh, cumulative license demand in the river systems determines whether any additional water is available for allocation while still leaving adequate uh, water supplies in the system to sustain environmental values. They commonly use the seven day average or the 10, 10 year return for low flow thresholds. Uh, some rivers or, or lakes are notably 
locked or fully recorded, which means that they don't want to have any further withdrawals. And I think that we have to continually uh, watch and monitor that. There was some discussion earlier about the NEWT system, and the NEWT system is an extremely valuable and good tool that's been put in place. You can go on the NEWT system at this point in time, and and I don't know if the OGC has offered for the First Nations to, to be uh, brought up to speed on the NEWT system. Mr. Chapman is uh, a hydrologist that is extremely knowledgeable on water issues. He's told me that he would be more than willing to explain the new system to whomever wants to listen at whatever time, whether it be Mr. Parfoot, or whether it be the First Nations here, or the regional district in our area, or whomever. He's more than happy to have that discussion and, and uh, bring everybody up to speed on what it is. The new system identifies how many uh, water licenses and applications are on any um, watershed within the region of the Northern Rockies and the Peace Country at this point in time. And it shows how much water is being withdrawn. Oil and gas companies do have to monitor the water that they withdraw. In fact, they're the only ones that do have to do that. Ten and, seconds. Sorry. And quite frankly, the Oil and Gas Commission, uh, I think, do an admirable job. They, they do look after our interests, and they do look after the environment. And I give kudos to that group. Thank you, Pat, for very much for it. I know uh, I see a respected community member at the back who's dying to get to the microphone, but will. <laughs> We, uh, are there any responses here from the panel? Uh, any comments? And make sure you talk, bring the microphone closer, please. Uh, the Port Nelson First Nation um, is in a working relationship with the Oil and Gas Commission. Uh, we do have a consultation process in place to, in an attempt to address some of the uh, concerns we have about water. However, the, um, the nature of the decision making process in the Oil and Gas Commission is very focused on permit by permit basis. There are no um, there are no real ways to consider the long term and the cumulative effects of all these water licensing happening. Um, the idea that you need a long term uh, permanent water license to do proper planning and water management I think is uh, is Premature. I think there needs to be a lot of work done prior to issuing 40-year water licenses in our territory. Um, we have not objected to too many um, short-term water licenses for fracking in our territory. At this point, we're okay with some of the, the work that's happening out in the fields. However, we do want a long-term, responsible, well-thought-out water management plan for shale gas development in our territory. That's all we're asking for. We're not saying no fracking, we're not saying don't use our water for fracking, we're saying if this is going to happen, it has to happen in a responsible way that not only meets the needs of the oil and gas industry, but also the needs of our communities and our land and our animals. So the, the, I, I don't want to get into a debate about you know, whose information is valid and, and, and semantics over what kind, you know, statistics. What we're asking for is a long-term forward-thinking plan to manage water in the face of this huge development that's going to change the face of our land forever. And the fracking that you guys have seen in the last four years is, is nothing compared to what's planned. There are seven proposals for um, LNG pipelines. All that gas is coming out of either our territory or the Montney down south. They're, an, that's, they're anticipating a 300-fold increase in shale gas development in our territory. And I don't have the confidence in the current water management regime that they actually know that what the impacts of that kind of development will be. So that's what we're asking for. The Oil and Gas Commission, we're willing to work with them. Uh, we, we're willing to work with Flynn Row. Unfortunately, um, I've asked this question of Flynn Row. A lot of those technical professional people that Mr. Pim has referred to, not one of them are hydrologists. The Oil and Gas Commission has a hydrologist. Flynn Row has none. So I, I think it's if you want to point to their technical skills and their professional ability to make decisions on this water, you should have at least one hydrologist working on that team. So these are just gaps in how the water management is happening in our province that we've identified over the years of asking questions, constantly asking questions, how they're doing things, why they're doing things the way they're doing, 
what what are the impacts and we're coming up sh they're coming up short so we're really putting the pressure on the province to do the right thing here and we're we're doing it for our children we're doing it for the future of Fort Nelson First Nation and Fort Nelson community so we're you know we're doing the best we can with what we got and we would really just hope that that you see that we are not trying to put a stop to shale gas development, that we are concerned about our land and our water. Thank you. Roberta, you have the floor. Use it. For you. <laughs> I don't have a question, I have a comment. I understand that it's important to have scientists uh, for the water usage, but I don't think we need a uh, science researcher to see the video that uh, Curtis showed that the water's drying up. That's visual. That's what's happening out there on the land and that's what our people are seeing. Our elders don't say this is how much water, a cubic water is being um, taken. They just say it's a high year, it's a low year and that's, they're accustomed to just visually seeing what's out there. And, uh, you know, the fish are having to leave their homes, so the fishermen have to move to find those fish. Why do they have to leave their homes? The moose are leaving, you know, the moose are getting abscessed livers, and th th that's the food that we eat. So, I mean, all the science is really important, I understand that, but so is living on the land for First Nations people. Great to follow up with a, another great speaker, Rose Lowe, I see, approaching the microphone. And just remember to uh, talk uh, right into the microphone so that our speakers on Skype can hear too. I will speak today as a user of the land. I've I was born here. I was raised here. Every year, um, like Curtis, like so many of the families here, we eat off of the land. Our, um, we, eat, we eat, we harvest berries, we live on the land. And this is the first year that I have not eaten what we, it's a fish that we call losh. It's a ling cod. And they're, they're not there. And I've lived in I've lived here for more than 50 years, and every year I've eaten them. We would eat them for breakfast if we caught them early, and you know for a change in diet. I grew up at the old fort. I grew up on the land, and um, where is that fish? You know those studies that. Um, our elected representative talks about. Um, I know that they're valid. I know you know we all need to work. Where that's not that's not. But you know, for me and for my family, like that has changed, and that's um, that's really significant. And that's all I have to say. Master Cho Rose, thank you for coming up and sharing your words with us and your experiences. <laughs> we may have lost somebody on Skype. <laughs> oh, okay. Are there any other uh, comments or questions or dialogue or requests for clarification? Um, yeah, Kim. So I get my information, which is the information that I rely on and the information that I base my opinion on um, from the Ministry of Environment, Environment Canada, BC Oil and Gas Commission, CAP, SEPA, Flinro, the Northeast Water Tool, numerous hydrologists, numerous geologists, Geoscience BC, who has done significant work on the aquifers in the Horn River Basin. 
I understand that there is there there seems to be a level of distrust that has has uh, it's deteriorating between Fort Nelson First Nations and, and these agencies, and I, and I certainly respect that. You've talked about baseline studies; you'd like to see them done. I also respect that. But who would you like to do them? And what happens if you don't get the result that you want? Are you going to trust those results? There seems to be a lot of agencies that there's there's a mistrust with, and I'm afraid that when the you get your baseline studies, you're not going to trust that information either. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Uh, have a response. A response from Lana Lowe. My my understanding of baseline studies are it's not you're not looking for a specific particular result. You're just getting a lay of the land. You're just trying to figure out what's going on out there at a certain point in time. So, I mean. We would, we, are, we would like to work with the province and the producers uh, to, to do the baseline studies. Uh, there are some initiatives in the works to, towards that end, but until that day, we would like to not have any long-term water licenses in our territory. It's that simple, really. I mean, we are, we're not saying no, never. We're saying no right now because we need to do this. There's some work that needs to be done and we're willing to work with the province. We're willing to work with the producers to get that work done. Kathy Dickey. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm sure there's a joke about old politicians fading away or whatever, but anyways, uh, past chief counselor of the Fort Nelson First Nation. Um, I think I'm sitting back and I'm listening to the different comments. Uh, Gilles, in his presentation, he mentioned the Northeast Water Tool. He mentioned information from the Oil and Gas Commission. He's mentioned the studies that they've done. And so there's so many figures and numbers flying around, which is accurate. And I think what that's showing is we need to find the information. It just, it just signifies that, you know, someone said, well, 1%, well, 15%. Does anyone know? I just, that just goes to prove the point. We need to find out. And we need to find out because it's not just the First Nation that's concerned. It's every one of us in this room. It's for Mr. Ellingson, for him, for all his grandchildren. It's for Mary Streeper and his grandchildren. This, it is so huge, we need to find the information. We need to have independent studies done. Bottom line, that's all we're saying. We need to have the information. That's it. Thank you, Kathy. Any other uh, questions or, or comments? This is uh, definitely what this evening was meant to be for, was community dialogue and bringing forward concerns and uh, talking about them. So we definitely encourage anybody else that would like to come up to the mic. Please feel welcome if you've already come up once or twice. Come on down again. <laughs> Well, thanks. I'm, I'm going to take one last kick at the can here, and, and only because I want to present as much information as possible, because I feel the same way as everybody in this room. We do want to look after our water. It's the future of all of us, and, and it's all of our water. And so we got to look after it. we got to uh, have the industry work in a, in a proper way. So I was looking for the minute, uh, a few minutes ago, I was looking for how many licenses there were. So uh, there have been... In the last 12 months, oil and gas operators, there have been four long-term licenses. Uh, the terms range from five years to 20 years on the long-term licenses. And longer terms are usually given when significant capital costs involved for pipelines and facilities, etc., for the water. So the only time you, uh, it was mentioned 40 years, you can have a license up to, and that's accurate. However, 40-year licenses are usually only given to a, a power project or something like that that's going to be uh, uh, like a run-of-the-river project or something like that. But when, when a company puts a, a substantial money as in Canada's project, for example, where they're going to put a, a pipe out into the water, it's going to go out into the water 20 meters or, or uh, 20 or 30 meters, and at that point in the river, that, that uh, river is 240 meters wide, so it's going to give them the opportunity to, to take that water out, store it, 
instead of having to go out and, and put their pumps on the river or in, in the winter months when they get their pumps out there it's going to give them an opportunity so they can they can withdraw that uh, when the river is running at the highest levels uh, so i just want to end with that thank you pat um does anybody would like, like to respond I kind of feel like an auctioneer <laughs> i grew up going to <laughs> cattle sales but um lana do you want to respond and so uh so we'll let lana respond and we'll have some more community uh dialogue just so the panelists know maybe we'll ask you to say in 30 seconds or less something in closing once we get to that point so you can start thinking about what you want to say after after you guys <laughs> okay uh, so regarding the uh, the permanent intake on the Nelson River that uh, the Port Nelson First Nation has officially opposed, um, I don't see why Incana would put out that much money to put in a permanent structure for a five-year water license. I we feel that that structure is going to be in the river for a very very long time. It's a structure that is unnecessary. It is an industrialization of the Nelson River that we don't want to see. We, our elders don't want to see that going on. Um, and Canada's doing fine right now with a million cubes a year with a temporary water, with a temporary pipeline. Until the work is done that needs to be done to make proper decisions in water management in our territory, we're going to say no to all permanent in infrastructure on our rivers associated to permanent water licenses. Uh, Angus Dickey. Uh, my name is Angus Dickey. I'm a member of Fort Nelson First Nation. I work for Spectra Energy as a community coordinator. Uh, this uh, question is uh, directed to uh, Dr. Alfred. Uh, Dr. Alfred, as uh, you're uh, well aware, uh, resources are under the uh, jurisdiction of provinces from uh, from back in 1930. And here in our, our in our area, uh, trapping rights, hunting rights. Have, uh, have gotten into the point where, where families fight amongst each other as to who benefits from, from the fur-bearing animals on that, that territory. Uh, and the nature of uh, my question maybe is more of uh, asking you to look into the crystal ball to see where legislation you think might go with the federal court recognizing that the uh, Métis and the non-status uh, Indian people have rights equal to, to status Indians who live on reserves, like the First Nations that uh, you know are, are considered to be uh, like the 630 whatever in Canada, I wonder where where this uh, this ex increased demand for access to traditional rights on the lands to fish to water. Uh, I'm I'm really concerned as to where the future might. Might might uh, bring us. Uh, would it? Uh, would would government instruments such as the Water Act be found to be uh, unconstitutional? Uh, it, it could open up a whole a whole new uh, can of worms that we're not aware of where we're going. So I don't want to 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 bring negativity to uh, to this positive uh, situation, this positive place where people are willing to to uh, try to be open and honest with one another. But uh, those things are in the back of my mind, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe other people are thinking too, like where do we go from here? This is, a, this is an excellent beginning. I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased to have been uh, you know, asked to do an opening prayer song with my nephew, Curtis. Uh, it, it shows that we can walk in both worlds. You know, because like, I, I look back at my late father, and my father, you know, he was a pragmatic man. He would, he would uh, take what he needed from the land, but also he knew he had to be accountable for what he took. And, and I've had the privilege of, of, of having, uh, being on the receiving end of a lot of traditional elders and teachers. And one, one teaching I learned from the Okanagan people when I looked in the Okanagan is, uh, you know, when you go out to pick berries, you don't take everything on the bush. You take one third. You leave one third for, for the animals and the birds, and you leave one third for seeds for the crop to come in the next year. So that whole reason I'm saying that is, we have to learn about sustainability. How do we sustain the way of life 
that, that we're really privileged here in Fort Nelson area to, to enjoy. And not just the First Nations, like so many of our neighbors are working out there in the gas field. You know, they're, they're concerned about making their mortgage payments, making, uh, paying their bills, making sure the kids are fed. So it's reassuring to hear Fort Nelson First Nation say that, you know, this is part of the dialogue. We want to be open. We want to, together, find solutions. So I think, Dr. Alfred, that's probably a big, a big question. Maybe I'm asking you for a you know, crystal ball you know, prognostication or something. But I, I kind of mentioned this to you in Victoria when I seen you at, uh, over the Christmas holidays. And I, I would just really be um, interested in hearing your opinion and, and your perspectives and your wisdom. And I'm sure everyone here else here would also would like to hear from you. Masi. Masi, Angus, uh, Dr. Alfred, are you online with us? Um, yeah, can I thank you, Angus, for your uh, for your question and uh, for your comments. Uh, um, so, Angus, uh, I think I got the gist of what you're saying. If I'm responding in a way that doesn't get to anything that you might have mentioned or that you requested of me, uh, apologies, and maybe one of the panelists could uh, could explain that to me, and I can get to it. But uh, I'll start off by responding what I did understand about your question and what I did here. Um, Thanks for giving me the chance to talk to this. Uh, when, when we think about these things, uh, of course there's scientific knowledge, there's, uh, there's facts in the way that we've been talking to them, but also I think it's important to consider whether we're talking about the baseline or uh, in a scientific sense or kind of criteria in this public forum for determining whether or not harm is, is potentially done or whether something is good and bad. Those are all value judgments. and. Uh, it's worth putting on the table too that um, there's a different framing and a different set of criteria that come from the government and industry perspective and that which is normalized in these discussions uh, and that which is uh, guiding First Nations perspective, especially those that are involved with land-based cultural practices. So uh, this may be stating the obvious for some of you, but it's come up in a lot of work that I've done in other areas where it's kind of a, an unspoken assumption that uh, causes a lot of uh, misunderstandings and a lot of uh, misguided decision making. Uh, and then later on becomes a factor in, uh, in, in redress, either legal or political, because of mistakes that were made in reasoning uh, in the early stages of the process like we're engaged in here. So the simple fact is that from the government and industry perspective, and from, from the mainstream of Canadian society's perspective too, I'd say, um, you look at all these questions and you make determinations on, on baseline uh, situations, you make determination on uh, parameters for uh, deciding what's harmful and what's not harmful. From basically a suburban, middle class, uh, settler, Caucasian cultural perspective, right? You know, and that by that all I mean is, the intensity of the use of the land. Um, and it was brought up by uh, a friend in the first presentation about, for example, he doesn't buy uh, meat from the supermarket. Um, it was brought up again in terms of the extensive use of uh, uh, fish and medicinal products and uh, plants and so forth in the diet and in the culture uh, of the individuals who are part of that First Nation who, who have been using that land since time immemorial. So it's, very, uh, it's a very important point to recognize that when you talk about baseline and you talk about criteria for decision making as to whether or not something is harmful or not, you have to be very clear and aware of the perspective that you're coming at that question at from. You know, is it, is it a suburban middle class where most of your food products are from a supermarket imported from somewhere else? Uh, your diet, uh, your medicines, everything you put into your body affects, of course, your physical health, your physical well-being, and, uh, and affects you and your family and your children's uh, physical health and well-being as well. Um, there may be tolerable limits for contamination. There may be tolerable limits for uh, disturbance of the natural environment. From that suburban middle class uh, Caucasian perspective, um, that are different uh, and certainly uh, affect Native people in a different way when their existence is 
different in terms of the intensity of the intake of the plants, the animals, the water, and, and so forth from that natural environment. So you can't even really talk about baseline from a scientific perspective without uh, understanding this question. And so when you think about, and as I understand it, Ingus, uh, the legal protection for uh, First Nations uh, practices and relationship to the land, and I'm sorry for misunderstanding the question for the reason I talked about earlier, but what is protected as an Aboriginal right uh, already in law and which looks to be even more protected because of the fact that uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has made very clear that traditional practices are part of the makeup of the cultural continuity of the Aboriginal people of Canada, that not only are they uh, a practice in itself in terms of a preferential way of living, but they are absolutely crucial to the continuity of that people in terms of cultural entities, in terms of the physical, spiritual, and psychological well-being. It's well documented that any disruption to these practices that is not of their own choosing and managed in a way uh, that allows for uh, a healthy transition to a different way of living, when those uh, practices are disrupted because of contamination or because of alienation from the land, they result in serious psychological uh, harm to the people, which result in all kinds of, uh, as they're labeled, social and psychological pathologies. So they're real, real problems for, for First Nations people. Um, I'm glad to say that the Supreme Court has recognized that these practices for that reason, and also because they are the inherent right of the people to continue on to exist as a nation defined by those cultural practices, protected by law, and look to be increasingly protected by law. It's, uh, it's a bit of uh, a disappointment, actually, on the part of First Nations that the modernization of our cultures is not protected as much as we would argue it should be. Uh, but the flip side of that in the Supreme Court is that traditional cultural practices are very much uh, recognized and protected. So the right to hunt, the right to fish, the right to gather medicines, the right to conduct yourself uh, according to traditional teachings on the land is a whole complex of, uh, of culture that is recognized in law and, 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 uh, and, and protected. And uh, I did catch that you were, um, you were asking for some perspective on the evolution of law as we see it now. Um, there is an increasing, uh, increasing uh, I'd say, maybe not so much increasing, but expansion of the notion of this to, to include other people. And so you mentioned uh, the recognition of Métis and non-status people uh, in Canada. I think that, uh, from my perspective, and there's a general consensus in, uh, in legal circles and political circles that uh, that question is yet to be decided finally. That was a federal court decision. So what we have, in fact, is a legal process that probably is going to be another 10 years in the making where uh, the federal government will appeal that decision. But uh, in spite of that, the, the indicators are there, the trends are clear, and uh, it's well established already in, uh, in Canadian law and uh, also in, in, uh, in practice too, in respect of that law, that uh, First Nations people have a right uh, to, to that cultural practice. And so if, uh, the effect, if, the, if the amount of water being drawn, and I'm no expert in this so I don't claim any of that, but just uh, to use this as an example, if the water being drawn, if the use of that water and the contamination of it uh, results in uh, the detrimental effect to the degree where First Nation people cannot continue to hunt and fish to sustain themselves uh, on that land culturally and their languages decline, if their health status declines, if there are evident uh, social and psychological uh, disruptions and dysfunction because of it, these are things that people can seek redress in in the law. And so that, that's something I think that people need to consider as well, that this isn't just uh, a question of economic feasibility uh, from the perspective of people who are living a middle-class suburban uh, cultural lifestyle. This is also a question of cultural survival for people who have the, not only the, uh, the right to choose, but the responsibility uh, within their own culture and within their own nationhood to maintain those practices. And so if it impacts it to a degree that uh, that uh, makes it impossible for our friend uh, sitting at the, at the table there to continue those practices, then there's a, there's a strong case in law to stop that activity. And uh, it's an expensive proposition. 
It's a very complicated uh, proposition, but it is something that other Native people, uh, both in Canada and the United States, have uh, pursued as a, as a last resort when uh, cooperative processes like these don't work uh, as a matter of cultural survival. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that for now, and uh, apologies, Angus, if I didn't get to any points that you might have brought out uh, in your question to me. Now, Merci, Dr. Alfred. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another speaker, Danny Souls. Come on down to the microphone. Talk okay. nice and close. All righty, thank you. Yes, I find it a delight to be able to talk today in a day when it's raining outside. Love it. Because uh, I thought of this meeting tonight as we were preparing for it and it was raining outside and I, I know that we have been short of water coming from the sky for a long time. I don't think that that's uh, the responsibility of the oil and gas industry to make the water fall. I don't think that it's uh, our responsibility that we, we recognize that as we do baseline studies, we're going to have a very difficult time if that baseline keeps moving. Okay, and so uh, I acknowledge as a farmer, I love growing food. Uh, I know that I need water to grow food. I've got some springs on my property that feed some of my garden areas. Those springs have been flowing out of the ground for years, year round. Uh, they, I don't want them to disappear. And so I, I really am cautious too about how, how close the fracking gets to home. However, uh, like as with others, I'm not against the concept of it at all, uh, properly managed. But first of all, I would like to go back to the idea that we started this uh, talk together with a prayer that came, and this is not a sermon, so forgive me if you think it is. Um, the prayer, there was a prayer to open this meeting tonight, and there's a recognition that the Creator, we see it all the time, when we, when we look at the way that the Creator has provided for our needs in the food growing that's natural here, whether it be our animals or our berries or whatever it be, uh, there's an acknowledgement that that comes from someone other than ourselves and that it comes from someone who has laid out, uh, who has created this in such a way that we all are beneficiaries of it. And if we manage what we live in properly, we recognize that it will be here for um, as many generations as there are people. And so I would say that it's important that we, as a people, not lose um, sight of the connection to the Creator because if you believe that the if you believe that money is your savior i certainly feel sorry for you because it's really tasteless stuff it takes a lot of salt pepper to make it work but i i think that uh, if you also if, if you do believe that money is the solution to everything you will not be able to put a lid on or put controls on the amount of water that's used the amount of land that's disturbed the size of the footprint or anything else if you also believe and worship the land itself, you will come to the same conclusion. I think it's very important that we as people remain connected to the, what is shown us in the natural world and work with it and not abandon that. I certainly don't intend to. Just one other point, and that is that in order to preserve sustainability of hunting and fishing and trapping, and though it's a right, if there's a if there's no fish, even if it's a right to fish, you're still going to go home without any fish. If there's no moose and yet you still have a right to hunt, you're going to go home without any moose. Um, I think that that is an interesting uh, thing. With a growing demographic, the First Nations people alone and the uh, addition of the Métis and uh, non-status, if we look at the numbers alone in this region, it, if you were to only count on the moose as your sole source, moose and the elk as your sole source of meat, um, they would disappear very rapidly if all of you were eating only moose. Because the numbers of people, even in the First Nations people, over are more than the moose population and that can sustain. So I'm not saying that the future is dim for moose eating. What I'm saying is that we have to develop uh, other sources of food, the plow and the the plow and the cattle raising and the grazing and the livestock of one form or another, be it whatever, has to continue to grow as a supply in order to maintain the sustainability of the uh, of the natural um, livestock and so on in the in the bush. So I just want you to continue. I want I feel free to speak about the Creator and the reason us sticking to the Creator's ideas 
because I think that's the way we will find long-term uh, sustainability and support. Thanks. Thanks for doing it. Thank you very much for, uh, for your words, Danny. Um, so now I think that we'll move into some closing remarks. Is that good? Uh, we'll start with Dr. Alfred. Uh, and just before you do, is Ben Parfit on the phone or he's no more? <laughs> okay, he's offline. Okay, uh, so we'll thank Ben Parfit and put it out there for his involvement. Uh, Dr. Alfred, sort of in 30 seconds or less, uh, some closing remarks from you? Um, well, I mean, in closing, the only thing I have to say is that um, I, had, I heard a lot of good perspectives and I'm actually uh, um, heartened uh, by what I've heard tonight uh, and the willingness of the people to come together and to share information. And uh, there seems to be a commonality that I've heard in terms of uh, people stated um, stated intention and the shared goal of uh, preserving the natural environment for future generations. Uh, people have different ideas on uh, on how to do that, um, but I actually uh, expected your meeting to be a lot more contentious, so uh, I'm glad to have been a part of it, and I just uh, wish you well and uh, find myself agreeing with the last speaker there uh, very much. Now, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alfred. Yeah, round of applause. Curtis? Yeah, thanks for uh, everybody coming. And, uh, well, that's a good dialogue, and uh, I hope uh, we, we answered some of the questions when we, uh, when we went down to Vancouver. Like, like we say, it wasn't our intent to be anti-fracking, it was just to do it responsibly. Responsible development, that's the key, that's what we want, and uh, we're just going to keep pushing for that until, until it happens. Okay, yeah. Just make sure the mic is close to you. Yeah. Thanks. Wayne and I also uh, recognize that water will be taken from the Sikonichi River for industry's needs and, and purposes, but we do want it done right. We want the river, our business, and our home to be respected. Right now, as I left this morning, they were cleaning up a glycol spill. And last winter, they cleaned up uh, about 500 liters of diesel that got spilled on the riverbank. So those things are, are very concerning to us too. So I'm uh, gonna ask Jill to say a few words. Thank you, Jackie. First, I was, I was very uh, pleased and honored to be here tonight and I uh, just want to uh, reinforce the fact that we still know so little about groundwater and it's uh, extremely important that we do homework and it, uh, it won't be easy, uh, it will be costly, it will take time, but I don't think there is any other way. Uh, and now I'd just like to ask Chief Wildeman to share uh, some closing thoughts uh, from her. So, thanks. Thank you, Simon. So, <clears throat> the Fort Nelson First Nations vision is strong, healthy, proud, and self-reliant. Um, we are the Cree and Denny of the Fort Nelson First Nation. We have lived and relied on the land since time of Moriel. We have used the land for harvesting our food, for gathering berries, for gathering our medicine and using the rivers to travel and move place to place. It is the final resting place for our dead and, it, and a lot of our villages are still out there. Um, we use a lot of our cultural sites for spiritual practices. We have not only the right to manage our land, we have the responsibility to do so. Um, we also have the responsibility to our future generations to ensure our land will continue to sustain our people into the future. And I feel that you guys would like the same thing for your children. In 1910, our ancestors signed into a treaty with Canada. The 1910 treaty affirms Fort Nelson First Nations right to our traditional lands and our way of life in exchange for the guarantee that we would be free to live our lives as formerly 
and undisturbed by newcomers. Our ancestors agreed to share our land and to live in peace with our new neighbors. It was understood that peace could only come if we were both left to travel our own paths as we walked towards a common future. Many things have changed in the 100 years, and at times the spirit of the treaty has been forgotten by our new neighbors. But our understanding of the treaty remains and will always remain as long as the sun shines, the rivers flow, and the grass grows. I'd also like to say that we are not against development, but we strongly feel we must protect our water, our environment, and our children's future. We are proud to work with BC citizens, industry, and government to find a responsible development and to provide sustainable jobs for our people and for BC residents and anybody else who, from around the world that would like to come work in this territory. Um, in this province and in Canada, we've always looked after each other and we sincerely hope we all can work together to address these concerns and to ensure that we develop a healthy, sustainable future for the industry in our province based on respect and shared values. Um, I'm going to get Lana to play a little video clip for me. Um, and this is, this is why we're concerned and this is just the beginning. And this video will have a time lapse. You will see on one of the corners, it will give you a month by month and, and the year. And you will see the water licenses that have been issued in their traditional territory. And again, like I said, the Horn River Basin, the Liard River Basin is undeveloped. There's some activity, but in the next four years, there's going to be a boom and there's going to be a high demand for water. There's no way we can doubt that there's not going to be a high demand for water. What we're seeing right now is just a small little impact. This is going to get huge. So, Lana, please play the video. So, it starts in uh, 2007. And these are oil and gas um, permits. Section 8. With that, I would like to, uh, if you'd like to um, share this animation with anybody, it is on the Fort Nelson First Nation Lands website. And uh, in closing, I would like to say thanks and musty cho to John Roper, Mora and her crew for set up, FNFN land staff for organizing this community dialogue, and to our community members, and to the Fort Nelson First Nation Chief and Council. We'd also like to Thank you for all coming tonight and listening to our concerns. So to all our guests, neighbors, friends, family, thank you for being here and engaging with us. And drive safely. And remember, Earth is a living being.